we better get started. I can't get the sound to work in here, but hopefully I'll speak loud enough that the computer can capture what I'm saying. So, uh, today's lecture is on bacterial genome annotation and analysis. Before we wade into, into that in detail, obviously I need to give you a little bit of a refresher course on some of the features of bacterial genomes and bring you up to date on approaches to genome sequencing because that's changed a lot in recent years and I'm not sure that you've been taught it earlier in the course. And then we'll look at how we assemble bacterial genomes, how we annotate them, um, particularly looking at protein coding genes and using homology. And later in the course you will see how all of this stuff threads together so that you can analyze sets of virulence genes within a genome and make sense of genome sequence data, which is going to be a useful skill if you stay in this line of work in the future. So just to remind you, microbial genomes are quite different from the human genome. So the human genome is very large, uh, as are other mammalian genomes, plant genomes, and so on. Uh, microbial genomes typically in the order of millions of base pairs, whereas obviously the human genome is talking over three uh, billion base pairs. Microbial genomes, we have a very high gene density. So I, I've said, I've called them uh, residuary uh, genomes. What you see is what you get. Basically within the bacterial genome, the genes are all just there, easy to see, easy to get a grip on, and there's not much hiding. Uh, there's very little repetitive DNA. There's very little non-coding DNA. They're very densely coding. Uh, and introns are vanishingly rare in bacteria. They're not completely absent. There are a few cases where you get them. Uh, but in protein coding genes, they are extremely rare. I'm, I'm not even sure if they occur. They certainly do occur in some of the uh, RNAs, but I'm not sure if they do occur in, in proteins at all. You compare that with the human genome where you've got these massive great introns. You've got very low gene density, very large genes that span large uh, distances across the genome. Basically in a bacterium, protein coding genes are short, typically about kilobase, so 1,000 bases, codes for about 300 amino acids for your average kind of gene. We have strings of genes uh, in operons, all under the same regulatory signals, uh, controlled by these promoters, which are just upstream contiguous with those protein coding genes. And the other thing that is notable about bacterial genomes is we see fewer of these non-coding RNAs. Uh, in fact, we do see them, and it is a, a growth area in terms of research, but uh, less of them than you would see in, in a highly complex mammalian genome. Just to remind you again, uh, we have chromosomes in the bacterium, and we have plasmids. Chromosomes, usually single and usually circular, but there are exceptions to that. There are some uh, species, Borrelia, Streptomyces, Rhodococcus, that have linear genomes, uh, linear chromosomes, um, and there are a few species, not many, that have two chromosomes. Vibrio cholerae is perhaps one of the most notable and most important. And in fact, you can get mixtures where you get a mixture of circular and linear molecules in the same cell. Plasmids are uh, independent replicons, as we call them. They are separate, they are autonomous, they have a different control mechanism for controlling copy number, controlling replication from the chromosome. Although they there is some, obviously some coordination with the cell cycle, otherwise pl plasmids would get diluted out or lost uh, in time. Copy number, fairly tightly controlled, can vary from one uh, per cell to, to, to tens or, or even more per cell. And these carry non-essential genes which offer an adaptive advantage in certain conditions. That little figure there also reminds me to say, or to remind you, I'm sure you have come across this before, that bacteria don't have a membrane-bound nucleus. So the genome is there free in the cytoplasm. Uh, it can be seen as an electron dense structure uh, uh, on the electron microscope, uh, and we often use the term nucleoid to describe that, but there's no membrane around it. 
And so transcription and translation are going on inside the same compartment of the cell in bacteria. So that was just a very quick reintroduction, I'm hoping, to bacterial genomes. What about sequencing bacterial genomes? What do we do there? Well, these are some of the stages in a bacterial genome sequencing project. So we have to start out by choosing what we're going to sequence. Nowadays, that's not so much of an issue. Uh, but 10 or 15 years ago, it certainly was, when the costs of sequencing were very, very high. When each genome sequencing project was, if you like, a, an equivalent of an Apollo mission to the moon in terms of well, perhaps not quite that bad, but it was certainly a very uh, demanding and expensive process. So there were a lot of arguments then about whether you <coughs> sequence laboratory strains that you know are tractable, but may have lost some of their original properties by <coughs> subculture in the lab, or whether you go for recent clinical isolates that have just killed someone, but you know nothing much about them. Um, in fact, nowadays, sequencing is sufficiently cheap to do both. Choose a sequence, and I'll say more about sequences, uh, the, the sequencing strategies in, in, in a few minutes. Similarly, choose the, the sequencing approach, the chemistry, and so forth, and say more about that in a few minutes. Then we have assembly, closure, and finishing, uh, which is very manually intensive. Data release, a lot of arguments in the past about whether genome sequences should be a immediate release into the public domain. Uh, or whether they should uh, be delayed until a publication has come out. So normally with the research, you don't actually release anything into the public domain until you've actually got a peer-reviewed publication. That rule has, um, has been broken or uh, it's been changed for sequencing projects in the past, although we're going back now towards seeing sequencing as just another kind of research and not anything particularly special. Annotation, we're going to say more about that later. I mean, basically, there are some parts of this process, like the assembly, the sequencing itself, and the shotgun sequencing, the assembly, which are fairly automated and hands-off. Closure and finishing, getting every gap closed, getting the whole genome particulars, that's manually intensive, and so is annotation. Um, and then publication uh, follows. And about uh, 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, if you've got a genome sequence for a bacterium, you've got a paper in Nature or in science. Uh, nowadays, if you have a genome sequence, you're lucky to get any publication at all. You can probably just about still get a 500-word uh, brief communication in the Journal of Bacteriology. So the importance of sequences, individual sequences and, and what's expected for publication have changed dramatically over recent years. So, again, I'm not not sure how much genetics, how much genomics you've done in the past. So if you've covered all this before, I apologize. But let's quickly just remind you about whole genome shotgun sequencing. Have you, have you covered this sort of stuff before? All nodding. Anyone want to shake their head? So basically, yeah, you rip the genome into lots of bits, clone it into plasmids, and then you se sequence the inserts. That's how it used to be done in the old days. And by the old days, I mean five years ago. Now we have high throughput sequencing, where sequencing has become at least 100 times faster, 100 times cheaper than uh, it was in the past. Kind of disruptive technology, probably thousands of times faster and cheaper. And there are several technologies in the marketplace with lively competition between them. And these are relying on fundamentally new approaches. We don't propagate DNA now inside living cells on plasmids. Instead, we grow, if you like, molecular colonies in vitro. Um, we also use new chemistries. Many of them are variations on the theme of Sanger sequencing. They're still uh, sequencing by synthesis approaches, but nonetheless, they do have important new features that allow us to automate them and, and make them work in a massively parallel fashion. So when we're doing shotgun sequencing now, we take the chromosome, we shear it up, we size select. We then, instead of cloning it into a vector, we ligate on adapters at either end of the molecule. Um, and in most of the approaches that are currently used, we still have to go through an amplification step to create enough template for us to sequence. There's a lot of interest in um, 
single molecule sequencing, and there are some technologies which allow this, but most of the, even the high throughput sequencing technologies do require an amplification step at the moment. And then once you've got the template, you then get on and sequence it using your uh, adapters that you put on there. Just to give you one example, again, I'm not sure how much of this you've had in the past, um, but um, as one example of how these approaches work, this is the Lumina sequencing. You have your DNA, share it up into pieces, stick adapters on, do some clever jiggery-pokery to make sure that you get a different adapter at each end of your molecule. You then um, ha ligate these onto, um, covalently link them onto a two-dimensional surface. And on that two-dimensional surface, you've already uh, ligated sequences uh, that are uh, complementary to the adapters that you've put onto the end of your molecule. So you end up with your bits of DNA you want to sequence kind of flapping around in the solvent, uh, tethered at one end but not the other, and then those shorter uh, uh, lord of primers on there as well. And what happens is that um, those sequencing templates uh, move around in the solvent, bend over, and occasionally they find um, a complementary primer. And because you're feeding this whole system with polymerase, with DNTPs, just like in a, a, a PCR, in a polymerase chain reaction, you get this bridge amplification and the creation of twice as much DNA as you started with, um, at, just like in a PCR, but instead of it being in, in the solvent, these things are tethered to a solid surface, and you end up uh, with twice as much DNA, and you keep repeating that just as you do with the PCR, um, uh, annealing and, and, and then breaking the, 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 uh, the bonds between those um, sequences until you end up with a dense cluster of DNA molecules which are either all identical to the starting molecule or complementary to it, and this then acts these then act as uh, the template for your sequencing reactions, and you can do this millions of these clusters on a single flow cell allows you to capture millions of sequences in a single run. Okay, that's just a quick run through uh, about sequencing technologies, uh, just to remind you how we do shotgunning and how we now use high throughput approaches. When we're looking at genome sequences, one of the problems we have, whether we're using Sanger sequencing or the newer technology, in fact, it's probably slightly worse with the newer technology because they have shorter read lengths, is that we, we don't get a whole genome of, say, one million base pairs from our sequencing run. We get, end up with uh, lots and lots, thousands, tens of thousands of reads that have less than a thousand base pairs in them. So if, if you like, we're left with a, a huge molecular jigsaw and we have to assemble this. And the problem is, uh, it's relatively easy to, to, to assemble things that are um, straightforward and non-repetitive. Uh, you can see in this kind of like toy diagram of how you've got these sequences here, you look for overlaps between them, and then you can then assemble those through those overlaps into what we would call a single contig, a single contiguous piece of sequence. But... Um, uh, and this works fine, actually. Uh, this so-called de novo uh, assembly, uh, there are a very efficient algorithms now, computer software you can get, which will do this for you very well. But the problem is that uh, if, whenever there are repeats in your uh, sequence library, these will give you problems, because there's no way, uh, just by looking at the repeats, of working out how, how you should actually assemble things. So if this was the correct orientation at the top here, as far as your software is concerned, it's also equally possible that you assemble them into two different contigs here, um, and there's no way a priori of knowing what is the right answer there. And so um, this means that uh, even when you have very dense coverage of your genome, and you may sequence the genome so that you... At a minimum, you're going for eight- or ten-fold coverage, but you may go, say, you've got 50-fold coverage of the genome. So you've basically got enough DNA in your library that you have covered that genome 50 times over. But even so, you will still never get to the situation, just from the shotgun, of being able to put all of that together into one single contiguous 
uh, 1 million or 2 million or 4 million base pair uh, genome sequence. So one approach to get around this is uh, so-called paired end sequencing, where you take the bacterial chromosome, and you shear it up, um, and then you size select for relatively large fragments, say three kilobases or eight kilobases in length, and you add your linkers to those. Then you circularize those, um, and again, with some clever chemistry, you can chop out the bit of DNA that's uh, close to your linkers, and um, then just add adapters and sequence through that so that you get a little bit of DNA from either end of your starting molecule. So you get a little bit of sequence and another little uh, linker and then another little bit of sequence and you know that those two sequences are about, let's say it was, you start with a 3 kb library, there'll be 3 kb apart in the genome. If there's 8 kb inserts, there'll be 8 kb apart in the genome. And this uh, helps you greatly in actually putting together that jigsaw and actually assembling the whole genome. So even if you only have a light coverage with this paired end sequencing, this can actually help dramatically in actually assembling things together. And so basically what you end up with a, with an assembly is something like this. You'll end up with lots and lots of sequences from lots and lots of fragments. <coughs> Those sequences often will overlap and they'll overlap to give you contigs. Occasionally there'll be a sequence gap in there where you don't have a piece of sequence spanning um, a region in the genome, um, or that piece of sequence in there is actually repetitive and could not be uh, unambiguously aligned. So you end up with these two contexts here, but if you've used paired end sequencing, you can still close that gap because you've got here a bit of sequence from here and a bit of sequence from here. You know the distance apart, and you end up with a scaffold that covers those two contexts. And so with the paired end sequencing going into your assembly, you end up with a series of scaffolds. Um, and in some cases, you can end up with a single scaffold that covers the whole chromosome. Um, and uh, you, you know the order of all the contigs in that chromosome. There's just a few small regions that will be left that are highly repetitive and you haven't quite managed to close them yet. Sometimes you do get physical gaps. This is more, much more of a problem when the old style Sanger sequencing where there may be sequences that are actually poisonous to the E. coli. We tend not to see this now with the new high throughput sequencing approaches which are where the sequencing is all done in vitro. Um, and if we actually, as long as we go to enough depth of coverage, we shouldn't get these kinds. If you, if you only sequence the genome at one-fold coverage, there will be parts of the genome which are just not in your library by chance. And you might have these gaps. But we aim to go for depth of coverage that avoid that. Another important approach, in addition, in addition to assembling genomes, uh, in some cases we do what we call resequencing, or mapping against a reference. Um, and the reason for this is that some of the sequencing technologies particularly Illumina until recently, solid sequencing. These give very short um, uh, reads, uh, less, less than 200. In the, in the past, a, year, a few years ago, they were less than 100 base pairs long. And when you try and assemble those uh, using the assembly software de novo, you don't get very good results. And so what people tend to use these technologies for is resequencing, where, in effect, you're taking your jigsaw puzzle and you're using the lid of the box as a way of orientating yourself. So we could sequence one E. coli strain that we don't know much about, uh, and then we would uh, map all the reads from that against a sequence of a, of a strain that we already do know about. Let's say we made a mutant in an E. coli. We know that 99.9% .9 of it's going to be the same. It's just going to be one region that won't map. These kind of approaches are perfect for that, and you don't need to do the de novo assembly. Another interesting uh, thing that we do uh, very early on without even having to think much about biology of, the, of, of, of the, what's going on in terms of the biology of the genome is we can do SNP calling. So we can look for single nucleotide polymorphisms between two strains. So again, we could take, say, an E. coli that we have in the lab and we could do something to it, put it through some selection process, maybe select it to survive in, uh, better in acid conditions and then we could go through the genome 
or, or we could maybe select it for antibiotic resistance. And then we go through the genome and we would look to see where have mutations occurred, where have, particularly where have these single nucleotide polymorphisms occurred. And these can be very useful in, in actually understanding how strains are evolving, understanding what uh, genes are important in actually surviving in a particular environment or, or adapting to a particular stress. In fact, there are two ways you can play this out. You can look for those adaptive changes. So, you know, we put E. coli in the antibiotic and we see what comes out the other end and we say, ah, that's the target for the antibiotic or that's the basis of resistance. But the other thing is that um, genes in genomes also acquire mutations that are completely neutral. And they do this in a kind of clockwise fashion. So if you just took an E. coli and you just grew it in the lab, or if you allowed a pathogen to spread through a hospital, through a country, through the world, it will slowly acquire neutral mutations. And those neutral mutations you can use to reconstruct phylogenies and build uh, phylogenetic trees that will then give you insights into the population structure of that uh, pathogen and into the evolution of that pathogen and into the spread and the mechanisms of spread, the chains of transmission for that particular pathogen. Okay, so let's now settle in on genome annotation, which is the, kind of the heart of this lecture. So what is annotation about? It's the addition of information about the predicted sequence of features that we add to that, just that flat file of the DNA code. Now, in bacterial genome annotation, the, the key thing we do is we go through the genome and we identify the protein coding genes, or at least the potential protein coding genes. It's worth stressing that what we're doing is making predictions. So we're, we're, we're saying these are the putative or potential coding sequences. We don't know for certain that we've got it right, but we do the best we, we possibly can. We use homology searches to predict function, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. And there are other things that we might go through and, and annotate, but I'm not going to go into any detail on any of this. Uh, we can look at where the applicant origin of replication is by using certain uh, measures of um, uh, the nucleotide composition. We can just count up the number of bases, the number of genes, the GC content for that genome. There are various things that you can do very simply from looking at your genome. In effect, annotation is the process of going from this, and I suspect there are no, there's no rain man present in, in, in the audience who can look at that and tell me what genes are in there and what they're doing just by looking at it. And say, oh, look, I can see an ATG, there's a start cone. Oh, yes, I can see a start cone. I can see that. No, I, I defy you to do that. What we on, want to do is actually get to something like this where we've got that stretch of DNA marked up in a standardized format, here is GenBank format, where you've got feature table and you've got, it's telling you what, the, DNA, what the, the gene is, what the coordinates of the gene is, where it starts, where it ends, what its name is, uh, what it translates to in terms of protein sequence, uh, what kind of function it might have, um, what evidence, here it's 100% identical to DNA A from E. coli, a previously known gene. And we can even go through annotation to things like this, where we can actually get visualization of the genome in a way that is intuitive and user-friendly. So we can say, oh, there's DNA A, there's that gene there. But we can look visually and see, oh, look, there's a run of three genes just after it. Almost certainly those are an operon just from looking at it, because there's no gap between them there. Upstream of DNA A, there's that gap there. That's probably where the promoter is. We can do all those kind of things very easily. And if you take the whole genome, there are ways in which you can visualize the whole genome. Uh, there's this measure known as GC skew, which you can see measured here, in, visualized here in, in red and blue. And that allows us to see where the origin of replication is in the genome. We can look at GC content through the genome and look for regions where that is heavily skewed in one direction or another and so on. Now I just put this part, this slide in here. All the things I'm talking about in this lecture is, is kind of annotation for biologists or bioinformatics 
for biologists. And it's a sad fact that actually in the biosciences degree program now, real bioinformatics has really been squeezed out completely. We used to run a degree program in bioinformatics, but we didn't quite get enough people. Um, real bioinformaticians don't use graphical web-based tools. They actually uh, use um, what we call the command line environment in um, an operating system called uh, Unix. Typically now people use a flavor of Unix called uh, Linux. Um, and the, what these people will do is, is create programs. They'll glue those programs together using scripted languages like Perl. They'll write programs themselves. Um, and, and what I'm talking about in this lecture is based on the assumption you're going to go and work in a lab, but you're going to want to come and occasionally look at genomes. If any of you do have a, a strong feeling that actually you like programming, or that you think you might like programming, then um, there is uh, the option of actually becoming a bioinformatician. Um, and one thing you might like to think about is doing an MSc in bioinformatics after you've finished your um, degree program here. Um, and if you do that, then there are many options open to you, pharmaceutical industry, uh, working in research institutes, working in academic life. Uh, bioinformaticians are always very hard to come by. In fact, we're interviewing for a bioinformatician on Friday afternoon, and it's going to be very interesting to see if we get someone appointable from that process. All right, so coming back to uh, annotation, what kind of information can we use to annotate genomes? Well, the easiest and quickest, quick and dirty approach is just to take the nearest organism for which there is a complete genome that's already been annotated and just plagiarise the annotation from that organism. And we, and we actually do that quite a lot. It, it is a quick and dirty hack. You can do that sort of thing in, in an hour or two. Um, so you can get a, a, a automated annotation of a genome if there's a, a closely related organism very quickly and easily. What we're supposed to do if we want to get a gold standard annotation, though, is we look at all the data that's out there, all the evidence. So we look at experimental data. So someone may have done an experiment on a particular gene. Let's say we're annotating an E. coli. Someone might have actually done, oh, look, there's a hemolysin. We know that someone made a mutant in that hemolysin. We know that that makes the hemolysis go away. That's it. That is actually very rare in terms of the number of genes and genomes that are annotated, the number of genes where there is experimental data is now a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Um, instead, what we do is we look at homologous genes, and I'll say more about what homology means in a moment, and we actually assign function based on that. So we say, ah, so this is this gene here in this strain. It is homologous to this uh, gene here in the other strain, the other strain they've done experiments on, we can safely generalize the conclusions and port them across. We can look at review articles, um, at protein families, groups of proteins. Um, we can do kinds of analysis on the, on, the, on the sequences. So we can say that some proteins are likely to be membrane associated because they have transmembrane domains that we can see in the, in the genome, in, in the sequence. Um, there are problems because these annotations, when we're doing that, they, they, if you're not careful, you start to believe your own rhetoric. In fact, they're, they're only predictions, they're not facts, and, and uh, some, sometimes people do get, come unstuck when they make annotations and they turn out not to be true. Basically, the, the more expert knowledge on the organism you're looking at, or the protein family you're looking at, you can gain, the better you will be able to annotate the genome. And uh, that is crucial if you really want to do a very good job. I said before, most of the work is done automatically by programs. It, uh, we have a site called XSpace where we can annotate a genome in about half an hour using this uh, semi-automated approach. But they only work really if you're comparing something that's really very similar. And even using these automated approaches, there are problems there can sometimes be conflicting predictions. And there you have to go in and make a human judgment, interpret in terms of context. Um, those of you who are Muslims would recognize the term isnad, which is used in Islam to talk about sort of evidence trails. And, and in a sense, that's what we're doing here. We have to really 
our annotation has to have a trail that leads from what you're saying about that particular gene in this organism back to an experiment somewhere. And sadly, often that trail, that evidence trail, is, is, is a bit loose. There's holes in it and gaps in it, um, and, and that leads to problems. Again, just looking at a whole genome view, you can look at uh, you know, these kind of uh, genome atlas type views. You can see interesting features there. Um, so I mentioned GC skew before, so like simple G minus C over G plus C thing. That identifies origins of replication. Now normally with bacteria, when we visualize them like this, we put the origin at the top. But Salmonella and E. coli are, are organisms that we've worked on so much and they have a defined start point that isn't at the same place. So here it's not quite at the same place. But the other thing you can see is you can see here these are genes unique to uh, some of the typhi marked on here. Here are genes shared with E. coli. Um, and you can also look at GC content as you go around the genome. And you can see that there, is, that there are these spikes like here, which correspond to a set of genes which are unique to that strain. Um, and that is typical of what we call uh, um, pathogenicity islands or genomic islands, where you've got a wedge of DNA shoved into this genome here and it, and it does shine out as being separate from the rest of the genome in terms of its GC <coughs> content. Um, before we go into a bit more detail about coding sequences, there's a few things you can look at in terms of the nucleotide sequence alone without looking at the proteins. Uh, so you can look for promoters, ribosome binding sites, repeats, you can look for consensus sequences for regulators. We've mentioned that in a previous lecture about regulators having consensus sequences. Uh, and you have these motifs, and you can make models of the motifs. You can visualize them like this and start off with a model that looks quite simplistic. Okay, you think that's a sequence, and then you add more and more uh, examples to your model until it gets more and more refined, so you realize that um, actually you can't draw a consensus. It's very good at that position there, but the one in the middle there, that C, is turning out to be absolutely conserved, and so on and so forth. You can predict tRNAs, you can predict ribosomal RNAs, uh, non-coding RNAs of various sorts can be detected using specific algorithms, in the, uh, and you can find those in the genome. But let's now turn back to the central problem, if you like, of genome annotation in bacteria which is finding the protein coding genes and annotating them. So how do, how do we actually find the genes in the first place? Uh, and there are various ways you can do this. There's so-called ab initio gene prediction, where you're not making any assumptions based on comparisons of anything else. You're just looking at the genome in front of you. Uh, and there are various ways you can do this. The simplest, the crudest, is to look for open reading frames. So stretches on a reading frame, if you remember there are six reading frames for any particular stretch of DNA. You can look through them and you can look for stretches of that reading frame that don't have stop codons in them. Well, those are called open reading frames. And by definition, if a, pro a protein coding gene must overlap, must be part of an open reading frame, Unfortunately, you can have open reading frames that do not correspond to protein coding genes. So this is only a very approximate method of finding genes. A lot of people still talk about ORFs as if they were protein coding genes, and I'm using the two terms synonymously. That is a lack of precision in the use of language that really is, should not occur in science, but it sadly does happen. You can also look at codon usage. So if you look at a gene in E. coli, let's say, it will, the genes in E. coli will not use the full range of 64 codons completely randomly. If, if, if they were, if, if you want to say in, in, encode a glycine, a given bacterium will, will not just go GGG, GGA, GGT, GGC completely randomly. It will, say a mycobacterium will preferentially use GGC and GGG as the, as the, um, codons for glycine. And so if you look on each reading frame and you looked at open reading frames and then you look at the codon usage, you can say, ah, they correspond to what we know about the codon usage. There's a lady asking. Coding sequence. 
So it, it means protein coding sequence. That works to a certain degree. The most sophisticated approach is, is, is we, sh we can treat it like a black box. It's called, they're called Markov models. They are sophisticated math mod mathematical models of what protein coding genes look like in bacteria. And in fact, those are now the industry standard for annotating uh, bacterial genomes. There's an alternative approach where you can just use homology. So if you think about your six reading frames, you translate them all, and then you search, you do homology searches, and we'll say more about homology searching. Homology is obviously very important, as you'll find out later. We can actually then say, ah, so that's, that, that one of the six reading frames there clearly is 99% the same as that protein sequence in that other organism. Therefore, that reading frame is what's encoding a protein in this stretch of DNA. Um, and that approach works very well as well. It's perhaps slightly more um, time-consuming and onerous than doing ab initio gene prediction, but in the best cases, people combine both pro approaches together. So I mentioned before, if, if you want a quick and dirty approach, you look for open reading frames. Um, these stretch the sequence without stop codon. There are three stop codons. Um, if you think about that, then Three, three codons out of 64 is about, just in a random piece of sequence, there'd be about one in 20 of your codons would be a stop codon. So, you know, you get 20 codons, then a stop codon will come in, and another 20 and a stop codon. If we say, let's say that actually 50 or say 100, coding, uh, 100 codons in a row, that, that starts to look interesting then, because the chances of finding, say, 100 um, codons in a row um, without a stop codon is, is relatively small. It's not, it, it isn't negligible. In fact, what you do with some of these ab initio programs is that they have a, a, what they call a long orphs um, module where they go and select a very long open reading frames, ones over 500 codons long in the genome. And they say, look, they really have to be protein coding genes. They have to be coding sequences when they're that long and they train themselves on those as to what genes look like in the organism and then go forward from there. The point is that coding sequences and ORFs are not the same things because coding sequences have a start codon, uh, usually an ATG, sometimes CTG and sometimes TTG, but usually an ATG, and that's in the same frame as the stop codon, and the coding sequence starts with that start codon, ends with the stop codon. The open reading frame ends with that stop codon but the open reading frame can start some way upstream of that start codon. There may be no stop codons for another 50 or 100 codons upstream of your start codon. Let me just explain this a bit more in, in term, visually, if you like. So here's a stretch of DNA. We have on one, one strand going in one direction there, the other strand going in the other direction there. And this has been translated in each of the three reading frames here. So, um, above and below. Here we have a visual representation of the same stretch with the six reading frames shown here. And in those reading frames where there is a stop codon, there is a, a vertical line. So just by eyeballing this, you can see that there are some stretches here, quite considerable stretches, where there is no stop codon on those strands over there, on that on, up there on those reading frames on that strand. But down here, there are actually, in the same places, other long stretches without stop codons, other open reading frames, ORFs. And so this just shows you that actually just relying on ORFs alone in annotating a genome for protein coding sequences is not going to work very well. It'll work for very, very long ones. But otherwise, um, it's not. I mean, you could go through and say, well, I'll just choose the longest open reading frame in any position, and that probably would work most of the time, but it's not entirely reliable. And this also illustrates the fact that ORFs and coding sequences are not the same thing, and it's, people that know me know that I rant about this, in fact, I tweet on it and I blog on it, a fact, a fact that coding sequences and ORFs are not the same, but you find very eminent professors, so if you ever want to bring down an eminent professor, whenever they say ORF, but they mean coding sequences, you can put your hand up and say, I think you're mistaken. I think you've been imprecise in your use of language. And you can show them up quite nicely because people that should know better do this. 
Anyway, these turquoise uh, arrow, arrow bars here show you the actual uh, protein coding sequences in this stretch of DNA. Um, and as you can see, they, they, they're occasionally there. This one here, for example, and that one up there, there's two open reading frames in the same region. You wouldn't really be able to choose between them unless you used other information uh, rather than just open reading frames. Another problem um, in annotation, in understanding what the, the kind of shape and look of a of coding sequence is a problem of frame shift errors. So if you have a, a sequence at the top there um, and it's got a run there of four A's in it, uh, now you might think, well, if your sequencing program wasn't very good at distinguishing between four A's and five A's, that wouldn't make much difference. It's only getting one base wrong, surely. That's a, a small issue. In fact, it turns out to not be a small issue at all because of this issue of reading frames and frame shifting. If you put an extra A in there, you shift the real sequence goes into a different reading frame. And, in, and a sequence, an erroneous sequence, actually gets shoved in to the reading frame uh, that starts at the correct sequence here. And so if you're trying to predict what is the sequence of this protein in this, this stretch here, this protein coding gene, what's this? You'd get it wrong for a substantial part of the protein if you use this kind of approach. So um, this is an issue we have because some of the, se the high-throughput sequencing programs have particular problems with what we call homopolymeric tracks, these runs where you've got 5As or 6As or 7As and you can't tell which is which. And this is something we have to look at very carefully in the genome and, and make a judgment as to whether it really is frame-shifted or whether uh, there's been an error in the sequencing. Because the problem is that actually one of the ways in which mutations occur in nature is through frame shifting. So genes can lose their function, can be disrupted by these frame shifts uh, in any case. Here's uh, some graphical plots looking at GC content by reading frame and amino acid composition by reading frame. Again, you can see that these actually are quite informative in terms of telling you which stretches of uh, which reading frame uh, a particular stretch of DNA is actually encoding a, a protein and which ones are not. Um, and this can be informative as well. I mentioned that the industry standard is called, uh, called Markov models. One called Glimmer is the one we use for bacterial genomes uh, generally. We train it on this long ORFs. There is a certain problem with using Glimmer. We all kind of use Glimmer, um, but it, it, it's not very good for small genes. It tends to, to it, you, you may well have a gene that is only 40 codons long, but Glimmer will throw it out and not recognize it. And we, and we do see this sometimes where you'll see bits of the genome not annotated by Glimmer with coding sequences, but in fact they clearly are there. Anyway, we better move on. So when we, we've got these protein coding sequences, we can do various things to them. We can look for transmembrane domains, signal peptides, those kind of things quite easily. We can look for homology, which I'll say more late, later. Mentioned about these frame shifting, giving us pseudogenes, we can look for SNPs. Basically, we, what we tend to do is we have what we call an annotation pipeline. So we predict where those coding sequences are in the genome and what their sequences are of the proteins associated with them. And then we do homology searches, we port annotation across. Uh, we apply in-depth analysis for certain things. We do domain searches. I'm going to explain all of these things in more detail in the next few slides. Um, and, uh, and we can do other automated analyses. So looking for signal peptides to see whether a protein might be secreted. That's a very simple bioinformatic problem. There are features of signal peptides that we can easily see uh, in a protein sequence. So what about homology? So homology is one of those terms commonly used, but often commonly misused as well. In this uh, setting, homology means similarity that arises because of descent from a common ancestor. And you can see here, uh, back in Darwin's day, in the descent of man, he made a, an interesting analogy. He was talking about languages and about the way in which languages show the same properties of descent with modification that living organisms do. It's quite prescient of him because obviously we now have um, this digital readout in terms of sequences from organisms which is very similar to language. And if we make an analogy here with languages, again, we follow this up, you, you may not speak any German at all, 
But if we align these two sentences, one in English and one in German, and we look at the similarities between them in doing that alignment, we can actually infer which parts of the German sentence correspond to which parts of the English sentence. We can work out what those German words might mean uh, just from this kind of comparison. This is some Linear B, which is a kind of uh, ancient Greek text, uh, which was pieced together using these kind of approaches, just looking at patterns, looking at alignments, looking at the um, inferring uh, similarities uh, uh, from, uh, and using descent from a common ancestor to, to work out meaning. If we do this with biological sequences, here are some bits around an active site of a particular enzyme from various sources here. The header. These are the amino acids in that sequence, and, you can, and they're aligned, and you can see in the alignment that some things are absolutely conserved, say that isoleucine, threonine, cysteine, those are absolutely conserved. But if you look further along, there are parts of this sequence where there is much less conservation, where, in fact, there's a different residue in each of the four sequences. In using this kind of approach, we can infer functions about the whole protein. We can say, ah, that protein clearly is homologous. It's going to be doing a similar kind of thing. And we can look at subsections of the protein and say, well, that part's really highly conserved. That's likely to be essential. That's part of the active site. That part, not really conserved at all. That's probably just some surface loop that's doing nothing very much, and so on. So we're stressing that when we're looking at genes, homology and genes, we, we have two kinds of homology, orthologs and paralogs. Uh, orthologs are where, basically, the genes are following orderly lines of descent in common with their res the genomes they reside in. So there's a speciation event. You get E. coli on one lineage, salmonella on the other lineage, all the genes that are common to the two are showing orthology. Parology arises where there's a gene duplication within one of those uh, lineages. So you've got one gene, say, uh, I don't know, a, a transporter for glucose, duplicates, and then one of those genes starts to produce a protein that's actually become specialised for doing something to maltose. And so you end up with two genes in the same genome that are homologous, uh, but um, they're called paralogs in that, in that setting. The xenologs are where we get horizontal gene transfer in genomes um, as well. I have to move a bit faster because I don't want to get thrown out for being overrunning again. So the key feature that we use with homology is that we can do homology searches. We can actually take a protein, and I, I still think this is a bit of a miracle. We can actually take any protein you like and compare it to all other known proteins, all proteins known to man, and we can do that within a few minutes. And we can say, ah, this protein is 99% the same as that one, 25% the same as that one, and so forth. And then we can rank those scores, and we can start to make inferences about the function of the protein based on those similarities. The industry standard for doing this is a protein called BLAST, which stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. It's very fast. It's very straightforward. It's, it's very informative because it can give you clues about function, history, important residues, and so forth. And there are several different flavors of BLAST. If you want to compare protein against all the other proteins that are known about, use BLAST-P. If you want to compare nucleotide with nucleotide, use BLAST-N. But you can actually take a nucleotide sequence and you can get the program to translate it on the fly into six different reading frames and compare that against the protein sequence base, that's called BLAST-X, and, and so on. Um, it's always good when you're looking at protein sequences, the protein coding genes, to actually translate into an amino acid sequence and do your homology searches with that. And that's to do with the fact that the, um, uh, the genetic code is redundant um, and there's more information in the protein sequence than in the nucleotide sequence. Another important feature that we have to think about at this stage when we're doing homology searching is that we filter for highly repetitive or low complexity sequence. So here's an example where I just typed in P. P, 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 many, many times uh, on the keyboard and then just shove that in and did a search of it. And BLAST gives you results. There are some proteins that have just long streams of doesn't really tell you anything about homology. That, that could have happened just by chance. You know, it's very easy just to keep duplicating a P. Um, 
And what we tend to do when we're doing glass search is we filter out these so-called low complexity regions um, because they can, they can give you a lot of mess, they can be uninformative um, and, uh, uh, and be a problem. With blast results, you get this result here. You get a, a, a graphical table, a, a visual table there, showing you this sort of the, 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 the kind of hit you're getting. The red ones are the ones that are very important, full length. As you get down to purple, these are less important. Some of them are not spanning the whole length of the sequence and so forth. Um, and you can click on those, and then that takes you to the, um, to the sequences. You also get a, a, a table of words here and, and numbers. Um, where it ranks the, the hits and the, the, the higher the bit score or the lower the E value, the better it is in terms of a match. Um, and for each of the... Um, so this is a typical blast output here. We've got the, the name of the sequence, you know, so a little bit of information about it, the reading frame. This is if it's been translated, uh, the, the scores. This has gone a slightly out of alignment, actually. Um, but that's the sort of picture you get. And then uh, for each of the hits, you'll get an alignment like this. It'll tell you a little bit about it, and then it will show you the query that's gone in, the subject that it's finding, and then between them, it will highlight all of the conserved identical residues by showing that residue in the middle there, and where it's, there's a match that isn't identical, but it considers it to be conserved. It's a conservative change. It's a similar kind of amino acid it'll put a plus sign there. So here you can see the long stretches here with, uh, of identical sequences. Those are almost certainly, this is an enzyme. No, this is a, yeah, this is, these are probably parts of an enzyme. Um, certainly part, uh, parts of an active site, I should say. These are clearly highly conserved, important residues. Nearly finished. Um, the problem with doing blast searches is that the databases are now getting huge. So you do a blast search, you did a blast search 15 years ago, you might end up with half a dozen hits. And you could just go and look at them and cheer it and find it all out. Now, you do a blast search, because so many genomes have been sequenced, so many protein sequences available, you may get thousands of hits. And it may be difficult to try and work out what it all means. So an alternative approach is to actually take the information that's encoded in all those thousands of of hits and make um, a domain database. So you can say, here's a thousand proteins, they're all similar in this region here. Let's abstract out the key features of that region, of the sequence of that region, and, and annotate that uh, and search against a model of that rather than against all thousand sequences. And this is a very uh, common approach now. We use a particular uh, site called PFAM for protein families uh, at Sanger, which is used for this purpose. Um, and here's the kind of uh, entry that you'd see in a PPAM domain. So we've got the C, C domain of a uh, non N terminal catalytic domain of diphtheria toxin, has an entry in there. Uh, lots of annotation on it to tell you what that kind of domain does, what the experimental evidence is, what the structure is, and so forth. So if you find a hit to this particular domain in your protein, you, you're already preloaded with lots of information that you can use to, to try and work out what it's doing. Um, I think we'll skip through that. Just one last point, really, in terms of the annotation, the problems with annotation. There is this thing called the annotation catastrophe, which is that when we're annotating proteins, we have to remember that they're not always entities in their own right. They are made up of domains. Um, and you might find homology between one domain in your protein and a domain in another protein. Um, but if you then grab the whole functional annotation for the whole protein you found a hit to, you may uh, be misleading yourself. So maybe you've got a hit here between these two proteins. The top one there's got a protease domain in it. It's got this middle domain here, which is homologous to this thing. You end up an uh, annotating this as a protease, when in fact it doesn't have the protease domain in there. Uh, now, you might say, well, that's obviously a problem, isn't it? So simple. But it, it actually happens, and there are examples in the literature of this going on. The other key point is that when, when you're trying to annotate DNA, annotate genome sequences, you don't trust the computer blindly because of these kind of problems of annotation error, people blindly just taking, borrowing annotation time and again without going back to the original source. So you have to use multiple lines of evidence.
Right, that's me finished. Um, so I've taken you through all these points here, features of bacterial genomes, how we do genome sequencing, assembly, annotation, and I hope that none of you will ever confuse an ORF and a coding sequence in the future. Uh, and we've also looked at the problems with homology. I'm happy to take any questions if you have them.